Hello, Math Fails. Now, I'm going to go ahead and categorize myself um, with reference to, to what you were asking. Uh, first, I'll say, you know, I used to really despise being categorized. I, I thought this was a simplistic thinking. I don't like the way groups and people pass quick judgments and categorize people, or even the way people categorize themselves. But then I realized uh, that we need categories to think. Um, a lot of my thinking involves categories and expertise in categories, and that uh, I've seen arguments in cognitive science about why categories arrive that are very compelling. And I've always knew they were good tools. I always like spending a lot of time, you know, getting cleaner definitions for categories and sets and why uh, things should go in that set and how the sets interact. So I sort of was able to integrate this by realizing that yes, categories um, can be applied to people. It's just that I don't fit one category. The category itself is sort of a projection of a, of a point of view. So like uh, an ist, you know, saying you're a somethingist. It's more like machinist, the word machinist. I mean, if you say somebody's a machinist, it knows how that they, it means that they have a skill and they know how to use machines. It doesn't mean they have this or that uh, view on, you know, cooking or love or, you know, anything else. But it could imply some of their views. I mean, you could find, well, a lot of machinists have this or that kind of characteristic. But really, those sorts of generalizations start to go beyond the scope of what the the category is really explaining. Okay, so I accepted a long time ago that we have no choice, okay, but no choice, but to s tell the whole story in terms of the frame of the ego, so the I frame of reference. We have no choice, okay, but I believe in a material world, and I, so I had to figure out, well, how could I have painted this picture and this understanding of the material world when I'm, you know, which involves we and you and it and plural it and plural you? How do, do we paint a picture like that when the only paints we have are these subjectivist I ones? You know, we have this world that seems, you know, and we would even call sometimes objective, and yet we paint it in the subjective I frame of reference. So I am one that reduces everything to this internal frame. Okay, um, but I'm not trying to recede, I'm trying to come back and understand, well, in something, some of my tools within this internal frame have been used to create these external, these models of external and other kinds of identity, like group identities and, and uh, third and second person distinctions. So it's like, if, if I was commissioned to paint a painting, uh, and I'm given, you know, a whole palette of paints, fine, I paint the painting. And then I'm commissioned to paint a painting and they only give me black and white. Okay, I paint a grayscale painting. Now I'm commissioned to paint a painting and I'm given mustard and ketchup. And those aren't paints, but I can put them to that use. So that's what I do. This is kind of what I feel like's happened. We, we, by the time we're asking the question of, wait a second, what paints did we use to paint this painting of material reality? We already have the idea of material reality. So it's sort of like an expectation, you know, and the question is, you know, and so we're commissioned to paint this painting of material reality, and why? Because of questions of survival, we, we need something to fill this role. And the question comes back and as, as an art study thing of, well, how did we do that? this thing seems to be made of this external thing, or that's what we're told for thousands of years, it's this external reality, and all we have are these internal objective, I mean subjective uh, pigments to paint it with. And so that's what I'm, I'm explaining. Now, when I do that diagram, you know, it's a metaphor in a diagram. I mean, it's a, it's a language in which we can draw things that I don't entirely agree with. Now, you start off with that, the, the real cup is out there in the material world. Oh, I believe that. But I just know that in order to believe that, that first picture was, a, that picture itself is a model in my brain, right? Right. Obviously, I mean, I'm the one that drew it, came out of my brain. So even though I drew it and it's labeled material world, it's just a placeholder, a variable for the material world. That whole thing's actually happening in my brain. And so this is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm explaining how we reach, uh, we reach these conclusions. And ultimately, I reduce it back down to that we're receiving perceptions. And the main distinction about our external models uh, is between the solipsistic one, 
which is contained. So that's not just you being forced into yourself. That's the whole world being forced into yourself, okay? That's the whole world being forced into yourself. There is no, no external events causing our perceptions. But any of the models that have external events causing our perceptions, really, whatever that external thing is, is material reality. If we're in a dream, then the material reality is dream stuff. If we're in a computer, material reality is a, is a VR projection. It would still be called material reality because we're not controlling it. It's not a, a function of our, of our own self. So I hope that kind of explains a little bit where I'm coming from, you know. It's like I'm not an objectivist, but because of this ego-based uh, idea that we're, we have no choice, I do believe in this, that we have to justify everything in self-interest because that's what we're starting with. The only pigment we have to build ethics or morality is concern for the self. So that seemed like a difficult problem years ago, but the more I've thought about it, the more it makes sense. Yes, we have a shared sense of self with our family and our species and even our planet, and that is where we build, how, where and how we build these concepts of we. Like you mentioned, we. We isn't really first person because it extends beyond yourself. How do you make it a we? Well, one of the answers is we have this built-in function in our brain that allows us to uh, to expand our identity like that. You know, we, we, we're grouping animals, so we have a mental faculty to feel a camaraderie, to feel the we directly. And so for me, though, I know that, well, I just use the word direct, and it's not very direct, because we start with pigments that are I-based only. They're all I, me, my subjective reality-based. So I need to explain, well, how could we get a conception of we, you know, from that? And you can see I just use the material model, because I'm using evolutionary biology. I think one reason we can do that is because we're built to do that. If we were a different kind of animal, a more solitary animal, it would be more difficult to create the conception of we. On the other hand, even without our evolutionary biology, just the premise of an external model gives rise to the we, because if there really is an external model, then we really can group people, and if those people or beings are working together, uh, then of course they would have a shared sense of identity and thus have a concept of we.